Okay, welcome to the uh, first video for marine invertebrate biology. Um, if you look at this uh, this little question, this little brain buster uh, quiz, have a look at the um, have a look at these questions. Stop the video for a little while, talk about them, think about them, and see if you can um, get the answers. And we will come back to this stuff later on in the uh, in the video series. Okay, and you'll see why this is uh, relevant as we go on. So here we go. This is the uh, marine invertebrate class. And if you look at everything on this wall, and when you're diving this year, you'll get to see some beautiful, beautiful walls like this. If you look at all of the color and uh, the stunning variety that lives in here, it's very similar to uh, looking at a, a rainforest or something that you're going to see or a, a beautiful garden with lots of flowers and the like. The difference being here, most everything you see on this wall is animal rather than plant. And um, the reasons for that will become obvious a little bit later. There's a little, one little uh, eel here, but other than that, this is mostly animal and mostly invertebrate biology. Now, it just looks like a giant mess of stuff right now, but as you finish the class, um, you will be able to identify most of the organisms that you see on this wall. And the great thing about this class is that it will, it will expand your diving and um, make even a dive where you have limited visibility. If you slow down and take a look at the small stuff, and, uh, incredible. It really just does change the uh, uh, what you see down there, whereas before you might be just looking for big fish and things that now you can go and sort of get an understanding of the of the whole ecology of um, what's happening on these um, on these surfaces, and uh, that is really quite amazing as we go through our diving. Okay, um, these are for discussion in class. All right, and we'll have to start with a little. Uh, video show and uh, this is a little pretty picture show to show you some of the things that we'll be looking at this year and hopefully get you interested in um, what we'll be talking about. Alright so what we see here is a sponge and it's very just an encrusting sponge very uh, small and then we work our way up we get the uh, golf ball sponges that we um, that we see around here and then we start looking at some of the bigger sponges and they get as huge as this amazing barrel sponge and uh, hopefully uh, if you go to the tropics you might be able to see examples like this and that is a phenomenal uh, specimen and could be very difficult to age a sponge so that sponge could be anywhere from uh, in the tens of tens of years to maybe even a thousand years old we'll be looking at anemones and I bet you didn't realize that jellyfish came this big. Well, in fact, they don't. That's a Photoshop picture. So, um, but they do come this big. And you can see these jellies are actually being targeted now. People, you can go to a, a restaurant or to a market in Asia and in, in different places and buy fried jellyfish. Uh, definitely something to discuss in fisheries management. There we have some of the beautiful yellow zoanthids that we see in our walls around here. Uh, here's a nice a soft coral, beautiful purple soft coral. Here's an octocorallian. Um, that's a colonial organism. You can see the little polyp sticking off, much like a coral, but it's a soft coral. Uh, but it's got all of these little anemone-like uh, little um, individuals living in this colony and you'll know a lot more about them as we go on. Another beautiful anemone. Here's some red warata anemones from on the uh, green shell mussels that um, are local. Beautiful coral, picture of coral polyps at night. Um, here we go, some, another branching coral. And if you look at this uh, image, you can see a massive variety of beautiful color and uh, habitats and that is all um, built by these tiny little um, very simple or, uh, polyp-like organisms, anemone-like or organisms called corals. 
and they build the uh, largest living structures on the on the planet. This is a picture from the Great Barrier Reef, and I love this image with the little heart uh, shaped island. Um, but beautiful, stunning uh, walls of coral out here, building these massive this massive structure of the Great Barrier Reef. Okay. Uh, this is a, uh, a brittle star, very s similar to um, starfish in some ways and not very similar in other ways. Uh, you'll learn all about the differences between these starfish. This is a local, um, local star here, uh, local, or this is a uh, firebrick starfish. Um, there's a um, crown of thorns starfish taken from the Kermadex. We do have crown of thorns starfish, which is more of a tropical species, but you've got to go up quite far north for those. There's um, a different shape of a starfish. It's a, actually a different class, but it's a, a similar type organism. And you'll see how the, the uh, structure of these sand dollars and these sea cucumbers and these kina, these sea urchins, all um, are very similar, there's another pencil urchin, uh, to starfish as we go through the course. Here's, um, might uh, be tough for you to figure out what that is, but that is a, a cuttlefish eye. Here's a uh, little octopus babies, those are mollusks. And here's a weird looking little thing from quite deep water, which is some sort of mollusk. Uh, looks a little bit like a, um, like a like a squid if you if you know what you're looking for very weird very deep water creature here's a uh, pawa a type of a pawa that's an abalone which um, you wouldn't think would be closely related to an octopus or a squid but they uh, you'll see why they are here's a bivalve a scallop and uh, some a lot of these mollusks are beautiful things to eat so. Um, we've got the uh, green shell mussels, and we've got a helmet shell. Now, what's going on here? This is called a vampire squid, and it's got this long tube with a rasping bit at the end. And he goes, he finds this parrotfish which is sleeping, which has used made this um, ball of mucus around itself in order to protect itself from predators just such as this while it's sleeping. But no, this man, this thing has managed to climb up on it and found a way through that defense. So it rasps a little hole in the parrotfish and then sucks the blood. Vampire snail. Here we have a beautiful um, nudibranch. This is a gem nudibranch that you'll see all over the Maori warrior if you dive there or Pilot Bay and all sorts of different places, Rabbit Island, Leisure Island. Very common, very beautiful. Okay, we'll move on to the annelids, which you might um, be more familiar with as earthworms. But in the marine environment, they take on some beautiful shapes um, and huge variety. Okay, this is a Christmas tree worm. How about this? Um, you'll know what this is. It's a type of crab. Looks a bit like a crayfish as well. There we go, and we like we're interested in arthropods because we like to eat them as well, uh, but also for because they are um, one of the most successful uh, organisms on the planet, the arthropods. Uh, on land, we, we're more familiar with them as insects. Okay, here's a funky looking crab and another funky looking crab, and a copiapod. Okay, so this is what the design for plankton was in SpongeBob. And then how about this gorilla looking thing? It's crazy, but you will see as we go through the course the similarities in body plan between these um, funny looking planktonic beings and these crayfish as well as a barnacle. Very similar body plan, but um, we, which you wouldn't know at first, but once we have a closer look at them, You'll see how they all relate to each other. Those are uh, Percivis, uh edible barnacles. Spell, sell for uh, 90 bucks a kilo in Spain. Okay, and here's a decorator crab with a well-cultivated well sponge garden. Lovely thing. All right, then we'll look at uh, bryozoans and brachiopods. Here's another nudibranch. Now, these things look like plants and are often mistaken for them. 
but in fact there's something uh, called a lace coral and here's another beautiful um, image of lace corals. Uh, they're very similar in their feeding s strategy to these things which you might think of are, are as mollusks but they're also a uh, another thing called a lophophore uh, which um, you'll understand what that means a little bit later, but they are very so closely related. And these things have been around for 450, 500 million years on the planet. So a very successful organism. Uh, and then a sea squirt, a chordate. All right, so this one's on a stem, and these ones are not, but these ones are more closely related to us. This little... Um, mass of color uh, that doesn't move or do anything um, too astounding through its life besides sit there and look like a sponge. But that organism is much more closely related to us than, than a more in, the highly intelligent octopus or even a, a crayfish. Okay, and here we go. Here's some variety. These are bluebell tunicates and then another type of uh, colonial ascidian, which and here's another one, another uh, variety, and actually two varieties because these ones are colonial um, bryozoans as well. So it's an amazing, quite and quite a bit of or an amazing variety of creatures, and we're going to look at some of the other phyla that you might see too, such as these uh, roundworms and uh, flatworms and um, Comb jellies, which are have these beautiful rainbow patterns, as you'll see them swimming by when you're doing your safety stops and floating by in the plankton. Unbelievable variety, and it seems like quite a lot to learn about. But um, as we go through these uh, these phylum, these phyla, and through the class, you will get to know a little bit about how all of these. Um, go about interacting with each other, um, forming the basis of, uh, uh, well, um, you can't say the basis of the ecology of the area, but forming a um, good portion of the variety of the, uh, of the, um, of what you'll see when you're in the, in, when you're in the marine environment. And they, um, uh, the, one of the main reasons why they're they're so important is because marine invertebrates are much more numerous than the chordates and the fish and the like that we're that we're interested in as humans. All right, so let's move on to um, a first question. So, what is a lot? What's alive? We're going to actually be looking at this and answering this question, and we're going to be looking through defining what an animal is. But we have to start with the basics and say, well, what is alive in the first place? So you've got some organic material here. Do you think it's alive? Just be, if it's organic material, is it alive? Okay. Well, the question, the answer to that might be um, to, actually, what you should do at this point is turn this, slow, or pause this video, think about this question for a while, and then, um, and then go back to the video. Okay, pause now. All right, now you've come back from pausing. The answer to this, if it's organic material, you may think it's alive. It may have been alive at some point. It may not have. But uh, if our bodies, if we've been killed, then we are still made of organic material, but we are not necessarily alive. Okay, so what about this? If this organic material reproduces, is it alive now? Okay, pause the video and think about it. Okay, you're back. All right. Is there an example of a of something that is organic and reproduces that is not alive? Well, viruses actually can reproduce, and they are organic material, but they are not actually alive. They're not considered alive by um, according to our, the general definition of what is alive. How about this? What if you have reproduction, and then you have growth from this, from the, the smaller offspring to the adult size. 
Is it alive now? Okay, stop and think about that. Okay, you're back. All right. What about this? Okay, organization. All right. So if we're going to have uh, some sort of form that can reproduce itself, then we have to have a shape that is being reproduced. There has to be some sort of organization. So if we've got a cell wall, which would be a typical um, bit of organization, you have a bi uh, something we'll look at a little closer later on. This is called a bilipid cell layer, uh, or a cell wall, uh, which forms two layers, two lipid layers. And this is common to all um, living organisms on the planet, this bilipid cell wall. Okay, that, that means that there's some organized structure. And uh, in order to be alive, organisms need to have some sort of organization. Okay. Metabolism. All right, here we go. So if something can take food in and have waste going out, it takes this the some sort of material in in order to carry on the processes that will allow it to um, it changes that and then re gets rid of the waste. It carries. It needs that energy or that that material in order to carry on the processes of things like growth. Okay, so if you have growth, you need to have some sort of fuel source to um, enlarge this cell wall or to make more material that goes on the inside or to make copies of yourself. Okay, and so there needs to be an energy source for that. Okay, response to stimulus. All right, if something can do all of these things, uh, is it alive? Okay, well, in this caption, we've got our little organism moving away from a light source. Okay, so uh, that the light source would be a stimulus. So what other stimuluses can you think of? Um, several might be heat, so light, um, pressure, okay, um, uh, salinity, chemical change, pH, that type of thing. So those type of things that you might get a response from an organism. Okay, so is that response organism alive? Okay, think about it for a second. Okay, so you may think about if you're back now. You may think about a uh, a dead organism could still respond to temperature if that uh, like if there's um, a shrinking of the muscle tissue or something if, even if it's just if it's just dead so there may be some um, uh, response to stimulus even from an organism that's not alive okay and finally homeostasis okay homeostasis you'll notice that here's our little but our little organism our little thing and the concentration of particles on the outside is much greater than the part concentration on the inside. Now, simple osmosis would mean that this would shed water, water would move through here until the concentration equaled uh, the inside and the outside, was equal to um, the outside. So if there's a difference in the concentration of whatever this particle is on the inside and the outside, then there's some sort of mechanism for maintaining that concentration difference. Homeostasis means the ability to um, maintain something the same. Stasis means uh, um, not changing. Homeo means the same. So same, not changing. So if you are like a, a perfect example would be human beings where we manage to keep our temperature at exactly the same uh, temperature unless we've got a fever. And uh, but that is through sweating, through breathing, through um, if it's cold, we can um, we can constrict the blood vessels uh, near the skin. We can uh, widen the blood vessels near the skin, but we maintain a temperature. So or organisms 
use all of these uh, or use an organism in order to be alive must have all of these uh, characteristics. Okay, growth, organization, reproduction, metabolism, response to stimulus, and homeostasis. Okay, that's enough for this video. We'll see you in the next one.